Hey, welcome. Today we start a conversation in the Gospel of John. And I, I want to share with you a, a little setup to this is why we're entering this book of the Bible and, and some of the importance is John, he just kind of lays things out and he really gives us some really important information. And for some of you, uh, you, you don't know Jesus. And here's the thing, you don't know what you don't know. But John, in his gospel, he explains this and he, man, he gives such detail and vital information about who Jesus is. And that is what we're entering in. And the goal of this conversation is that we're going to go chapter by chapter. And today we're just dealing with the, what's called the prologue. So we're not even dealing with one whole chapter today, but we're going to go chapter by chapter. And John is 21 chapters, so you can do the math on that. That's some time that we're going to devote to this. And we're going to take breaks in a couple weeks. We're going to deal with marriage and relationships, and we're going to dive back into the Gospel of John, and we're going to enter into Easter, and then we're going to get back into the Gospel of John. So we're going to go through this together. Uh, and I believe, man, the Gospel of John, it has such important information for us to go through. But something that we wanted to support you with is we have these available. This is the Gospel of John journal. It has commentary and context. You can download this on our website for free right now. And you can actually take your sermon notes and everything right in here and every week just kind of see more clarity each chapter and what it means. Not only that, if you'd like a physical copy like me, I want a physical one where I can do it with my Bible right there and write in it. Uh, you can get that. You just got to contact us. Let us know you want one. Small feed just to make sure we get it to you. Um, but if you want and you can, uh, take advantage of the Gospel of John journal as we dive into this vital and important letter that we're going to get into right now. And here's some context. The Gospel of John uh, is one of the Gospels. There's four Gospels. The other three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called the synoptic Gospels because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they share like the same kind of like timeline and stories and ministry of Jesus. But the Gospel of John, he comes at it with a different point of view. And we see different stories that we don't even see in the other Gospels. So he's kind of this outsider Gospel that we're getting into today because he has a different purpose and intention in why he is writing this Gospel that we would see who Jesus really is and with all full clarity. And that's what we're going to get into right now in this moment. But the Gospel of John, he, he starts with what's called the prologue, and that's where we're going to stay today, the first 18 verses in, in his uh, letter are called the prologue and he just sets it up and it's it's actually best understood it's like star wars every time you hit play uh, star wars starts with bah, 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 and like lyrics start coming up and it's like the empire has fallen like i wish i could be that voice that speaks i always want to do that for commercials like darkness has come like and that's what's happening in a story is being told to us before we actually enter and see what's happening right so in Star Wars, you're told information before you actually get into it. In the prologue, John is telling you information before you jump into the ministry of Jesus. That's what's occurring. That's what we're looking at right now in this moment. The prologue is just before, but it's significant. There's vital stuff happening here. In the prologue, the first 18 verses, John uses words like life, light, darkness, witness, sun, Father, Word, Jesus Christ, God's relation to the world, uh, the character of humanity. Like he lays out everything you need to know. And then throughout the rest of the gospel, he's going to deal with those, all those pieces of information in greater detail. But he's setting the whole scene and the whole stage for what needs to be understood for us. See, for many of us, I, I don't want you to think it's a bad thing. Like for some of us, we... You might even have a shirt that says, like, Jesus is my homeboy, and you, you got it in your closet right now. You're like, oh, I should wear that. Like, Jesus is my best friend, like, which is totally, like, yeah, we have that type of relationship with Jesus. But the problem and what John is going to show us is it, it, we, we can't fully just look at it as, like, Jesus is my buddy. Like, Jesus is my best friend. Like, because if we look at it that way, we're, we might be missing something, and that's what John shows us. No, Jesus created all things. Jesus is Lord, creator of all things. That's you too. Your best friend isn't, isn't just your best friend. He, he created you. So it's understanding things in a greater context with the full scene. That's what John does in the prologue. So that's what we're going to jump into 
right now. We're going to go to verse 1, and you can jump there with me. Verse 1, it says this, it says, In the beginning. And like, we can stop already because that sounds familiar. Like if you're a parent in the other room and your kid hits play on the TV and you hear, like you already know what's happening. You know Star Wars is occurring in the other room. This is what's happening here. When you read that in the beginning, for everyone reading that, when John first wrote that, they already are transported right back to Genesis. Same language. In the beginning. So, so John is connecting us to the first book of the Bible, in the beginning. But in Genesis, what it says is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And in John, what he says is, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this is what he's sharing, but he's connecting us to the beginning. And, and, and he's saying that this Word existed at the same time as Genesis where it says God created the heavens and the earth before anything, the beginning, before anything existed, this moment in time, and the word existed is what we're told. So this occurs. Now, for, for, for many, when this text was written in the original context, this would not be surprising for them, especially this word, word. They would hear this and they would, they would already connect to it. Genesis speaks about by God's word, things are created. In Psalms, it says that through God's word, things happen, right? So they're, they're connecting this. This is not a surprise, but this is a surprise for me. And it's a surprise for you if you really stop for a moment. This is one of the gospels. The gospels start with the ministry of Jesus, right? They start with Jesus. So where's the little girl that's talking to an angel? And the angel is like, hey, you're going to have a kid. And she's like, what? No, I'm not even married yet. That's not possible. And he's like, no, you are. It's from God. You're going to have it. And she's like, what? Okay, I got to figure this out now. Like, and now she has a little baby. And she's like, it's Jesus. And uh, he's cool. And that's how we think the gospel should start. Like, where's baby Jesus with the little fleece, like diaper? And like, where's all the animals like dancing and singing songs? Like, what's happening here? Right here, we're told in the beginning, the word. And, and if we continue on, what we'll see is the word is connected and speaking of Jesus. But Jesus, so Jesus starts in this gospel as well, but not as little baby Jesus. We're introduced to Jesus from the very beginning, the moment of creation. He was already there. This is what we're introduced to. And John points to who Jesus is, not just how he came to earth. See, John is making sure we get the full picture of Jesus as fully divine. So he, he's, he's less worried about you knowing that Jesus came in a humble little way and, and was birthed and, like, was in a little manger and, like, cute little gifts were given by kings and, like, little shepherd or hear it and they see a star. He's not as concerned about that detail as he's concerned about making sure we understand Jesus our Messiah, our Lord and Savior from the very beginning. Before anything, he was there. And this is what he introduces us to. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. And then it continues on. Verse 2, it says, he existed. Now, all of a sudden for us, we're like, whoa, the word now is, we're told is a person of some kind. He existed in the beginning with God. So now it's this connection that we have to start dealing with, and this is where we have our theology of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all like separate but all one, and it gets us confused, and it's, it's this thing where it's like, you know a th person that talks in the third person, and they're always weird. They're like, oh, Scott thinks the weather's nice today, and you're like, dude, why are you talking like that? Like, we're, we're connected to this moment where we're told, like, Jesus, the Word was with God, but also was God, and this is now what we're introduced to, but also in verse 2, what, we're, what we see is literally John just repeats himself. John literally just says, he existed in the beginning with God. It's like, yeah, you already said that in verse 1. What's, what, what's the point? What are you getting to? And he's repeating it for importance that we would understand. He restates it, and then he sets us up with verse 3. Continuing on, it says, God created everything through him and nothing was created except for through him see what we're told is everything is through him 
Nothing can be created except through him. He's repeating himself over and over again so we understand. All things occur and happen through him. Verse 4 says, the word, so now we're connected back to that, gave life to everything. Again, we're just told everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. That he accomplishes all things in verse 5. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. And there's some important things that we see in this. It is, is what we're told is he's there in the beginning, but then we're connected to he creates all things. All things are created through him, everything. So now we're connected to the word and the relation to the world. All things are created through him. And it continues. And now the word is now connected to light. So he's also called light. And, and he, he experienced all darkness and no darkness can exist around him, connected to him. And we're connected more to this picture of who Christ is. And then verse 6 comes and it says, God sent a man, John the Baptist. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, like we're, we're, we're told about Jesus and like the word from the very beginning. He creates all things, light and darkness, all this stuff. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, John the Baptist. For some of us, first, John the Baptist is not the author of John the Gospel. But now we're introduced to this character, John the Baptist. Who is he? What, what is, why is he referenced right here, right now? And it continues, verse 7, it says, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. But then verse 8 wants to make sure you get it. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. Now we're introduced to John the Baptist, someone that prepares the way. To share the news of the one that is coming. And then we get to verse 9. And verse 9 says this. The one who is the true light. Who gives light to everyone. And then it says this. It says, was coming into the world. And one of the worst feelings in life is to wait. For some of you, you felt so awkward right now. That's the worst feeling when there's waiting that's occurring. And I want to point this out because as we're told in this moment, there's this waiting. John the Baptist is there. He shares the news of the one that's coming, but the one has yet to come. And this is a period in time, and it's known as intertestamental period, between uh, the time of the last letter in the Old Testament and the first gospel in the New Testament. What it's known as Malachi, the last letter written, and then one of the gospels, the first letter. In that time period, God was silent. Nothing happened, right? Like, we, we, we have no new letters. It's 400 years, a period of time where it feels like God is silent and he's not speaking anything new to people. It's in this period that, that things occur, but it's in the silence that is difficult. And this is known as a silent period of time. 400 years. For some of us, maybe today, you, you feel like God's been a little silent in your life. You've been like wanting and desiring some direction, some, some assurance, some, some, some form, and it just feels like, man, things are just... You're not hearing nothing. You feel like God isn't that present in your life, whatever it might be. And this period of time, it was that. Just imagine 400 years. If you lived in that period of time, like you're told all these stories, like, like a burning bush, like a, an ark and a bunch of water. And you're told all this stuff and you're like, what's happening now? Like, I don't see nothing. 400 years, intertestamental period. There's a couple of things I want to point out that do occur that we can look at historically. One of those is a, a person by the name Alexander the Great, right? He, he's got the name The Great because he did something pretty great, I guess, right? Like he conquered other nations where he actually, all other nations he conquered began to speak his language, Greek. Another thing happened during that time. The Old Testament, the Bible, the scripture they had at that time was translated into Greek. 
Another thing that happened is something called the Socratic method. It's a, actually a, a, a philosopher came up with this like, hey, to understand and learn things more, it's better not just to always have someone lecture. Like some of us, we totally get that. You go to class and you got a teacher that talks for an hour and they got the most monotone voice where they're like, welcome to there. And you're like, I'm going to fall asleep. Like it's that, it's that. Now, so Socratic method is, hey, instead of that, there's dialogue. What if like, I say something and you ask question and then we respond to each other. We actually learn better. Another thing that happened during this period is the Romans conquered. So no longer the Greeks, but the Romans and they conquer. And it's known as a season of peace, but kind of oppression, but peace. There's no more like wars and all this stuff. And but another thing happened and they started to create roads, highways from cities and metropolitans to other locations where people could travel more easily. And then finally, something called the diaspora. It's where the Jews were dispersed, actually pushed out of their nation and their cities into other areas. So I want you to hear this is, is just because God feels silent does not mean God is absent. Just because he feels silent in this 400 years, he might have, it might have felt silent. It doesn't mean he's absent because here's what I want you to see. He, he was doing some stuff. See, with that, Alexander the Great took over. They began to speak Greek. Other people were sharing the news of who God is through the language, and they could understand. Through that period of time, the scripture was actually translated so they could read it for themselves and hear about who God is. Through that, they were able to have conversations and dialogue that we can actually look in scripture where Paul meets with Greeks, and he meets with them where they're at, and he talks to them, and they have dialogue, and they realize who Jesus Christ is. Through that, roads are prepared. What for? The gospel to spread. It wouldn't have spread like it did except for because of that period of time where roads were created and traveling could occur. It happened because Jews, without them knowing it or wanting it, were forced to infiltrate other cities to share the good news. It might feel like God is silent, but God is not absent. There might have been a season of waiting, but God was still working. And this is what we see in this moment. We're told that the, the one was coming into the world, but has not yet. And for so many, they're waiting 400 years. What is happening, God? Why are we still waiting? Like, why won't you do what you say you're going to do? And they're waiting, but he was preparing something. He's doing something in this season, in this moment. See, I want to ask this question is, how is God using a silent season in your life? Maybe to strengthen something. As we look at this moment, even in my life, I can look back and there's seasons that I can look at and there's seasons where I feel like God was already putting it on my heart for that next step in my ministry, in my life, and, but it wasn't yet happening. And I'm waiting and I'm getting frustrated. But I can look back and I look at, that season where I was waiting for something, God was still working because he was maturing me. He was, he was man, he, he, he gave me time to really focus even on my family. He, he gave me time where I, I, I said, hey, why not? And I went and got my master's in theology because I, I, I could, and it prepared me for the season to come. For some of you, you're waiting today. You're waiting for God to do that thing. And, and because it's on your heart, you're expecting it. And you're like, why won't you do it, God? And maybe it's that career. It's that promotion. It's that thing. And you're waiting. And why won't he do it? And, and maybe it's because right now he's working something else. Maybe he's working some people out that are going to only be issue in your life. And he's already paving a way for you. Maybe it's because he's getting that, that certificate or that degree or that license or whatever that is to even qualify you even more. A season of waiting is not wasted. God is doing something even in a season where we have no new news is a season where he's preparing the gospel to spread because he's about to come to this earth to prepare a way for you and me. It's a season of, of, of waiting for you. Maybe it's that health and you're still waiting and you're like, man, I've, I've had to change my whole life. I can't eat certain bread anymore and different things and, and I'm eating stuff I don't ever want to eat again and like I'm doing all this stuff because I want to see my health get better but it's not. Like what is God doing? Maybe he's building your resolve. 
Maybe I know people in my life that I can look at and go, how, look at what they're going through in their own health and how can they still find joy and they're, they're getting through things. Maybe it's an example for others as well, but maybe he's also building healthier habits in your life. Like it's these things that we look at and we just want to get to the finish line, but he's preparing something. He's strengthening us for the season to come. During this period of time, the, the dark times or the silent times, this period, for many, we look at it was just we had to wait until, until the Gospels came. And now, here we go, the new covenant's coming. But maybe we need to stop and just realize what's occurring in this is God was preparing some things that needed to be prepared so that when Jesus would come, the gospel would spread. The gospel would reach you. And the gospel would reach me. He was preparing some things. He's working some things. A season that feels like it's waiting, God is working. For some of you, the question is, what should I do when I'm waiting? What do we do when we feel like we're in a waiting season? I want to encourage you. Sometimes what we need to do is the only thing we should do, and it's to get closer to God. It's to say, you know what? During this season, I can't force the issue, and I can't move those obstacles, and I can't get through that season on my own. But what I can do is I can go to God. I can go to His Word. I can say, you know what? I'm going to take this journal, and I'm going to start to see what is the Gospel of John and God's Word for my life? What does it have for me? How is it going to change me, transform me, impact me? Maybe it's a season where it's like, I'm going to get closer to God through prayer as well. And I feel like I'm waiting and I'm frustrated because I want things to happen on my time frame, but I got to trust God's timing, not mine. And it's saying, you know what? During this season, I'm just going to get closer to God until he starts to show me the steps to move forward for the season to come. But for you that don't know Jesus, you don't know what you don't know. Here's what I want you to know. The prologue sets it up. John explains this. Jesus, this historical character that we can look at, is far more than that and that we can't miss it. Jesus is Lord himself, that he would come to this earth for us, that he is already telling us from the very beginning he had a plan in place to redeem us. He calls us sons and daughters. For some of you today, that's hard to even understand because your experience with relationships and Parents, it is not the greatest. You don't have this idea of a loving and caring and compassionate father. So you hear that and you're like, I don't know. Like what I want you to hear is the father figure of Jesus shows us plainly of what he has done and what he is doing in our lives. He's calling us in. He has prepared a way from the very beginning. He sent messengers like John the Baptist to share the good news for this point. He knows you. He knows every detail about you. He's calling you to recognize him because life is life when you live it out in Christ. So I want to say this. I believe maybe right now is a moment where you feel that tug. Maybe you feel that encounter. It's, it's the spirit working on you, transforming you. And all we're called to do is to recognize it. The greatest news ever, the gospel is this, you and I, we can't do it on our own. We continue to mess it up. But Christ, God himself, came in human form to deal with that issue once and for all. And all we are called to do is recognize it. And right now, maybe this is the moment you recognize it. I'm going to ask you, would you just repeat this prayer after me? And I'm going to ask everyone, we're going to say this prayer together. But this is just us recognizing who Christ is. Say this with me, Heavenly Father. God, I recognize you. I recognize Jesus as my Lord and Savior. From the very beginning to this moment right here, right now. God, that through this recognition, I'm repenting of myself and my sin. And I'm recognizing my identity in you. God, would you control and transform my life? That I will follow you. That I will realize my identity in you. And it is because of your amazing grace. 
in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you said that prayer for the very first time, I want to celebrate with you. And the best way we can do that is first, would you just text me? Text me on the number below. And I'm going to reach out to you. We're going to share with you. Because here's the thing. This step that you're taking, this step, it's the first step. It's the beginning of a journey. And we want to come alongside and help you on that journey. As we go through the journey of the Gospel of John, what we're going to see is that God, Jesus Christ, from the very beginning had a plan and we begin to see his ministry and who he is and him displaying himself for us. It starts here today.